So I'm Evelyn Hubert. I'm very happy to uh, be uh, chairing this uh, third session of the Foundation of Computational Online Seminar. Um, we are very delighted today to have uh, for speakers first Alice Guillonnet and in an hour Edward Saf. So before we dive in, I'd like to review some of the features of this, um, the technical features. So the chat function is for everybody to exchange among participants. But if you'd like to ask a question to the speaker, I invite you to use the uh, raise your hand function under the reaction button. And uh, then I will unmute you. So please kind of stay unmuted until uh, you, uh, the speaker moves on, because sometimes there are some follow up or precisions to be offered on your questions. So it's easier if you stay unmuted until the speaker moves on. After the second talk, the channel will be left open if you want to make an announcement or just exchange further with the speakers or with the other participants. So I think it's uh, that's about it for the technical feature, uh, except that um, this the video of the, the talks will be available soon on the YouTube channel, so you can uh, watch rerun or encourage people to um, to look at it later. And so now I will uh, like to introduce the first speaker. So this is uh, Alice Guillonnet. She's a research um, in mathematics at the National Scientific Research Center in France. She's the author of four books and now leads the European Research Council Advanced Project for Large Deviation on Random Matrices. Alice is a member of the Academy of Sciences in France and in Europe, and presently the co-editor of the Annals of Probability. Prior to this, she has held several leadership positions and has received numerous recognitions for her contributions to mathematics and statistics. Among those, I will only mention the Leve International Prize in Probability. And as I believe in short introduction, I'll simply give the floor to her for her talk on rare events in random matrices. Please, Alice. Thank you very much for this very nice uh, introduction. Uh, so thanks so, also for the invitation to talk to this uh, Congress in, uh, on funda Foundations of computer Computational Mathematics. Well, I'm hesitating because I never had the chance to, to go to this conference. I wish I would. And uh, I hope I soon will have another opportunity. So I would like to talk about rare events in random metric theory, which is indeed the subject of uh, the ERC grant uh, I was awarded uh, last year. And um, so this would be based on recent joint work with uh, Fanny Ogeri, Julio Biroli, Jonathan Husson, and Milan Maida, but also on older works with uh, Gerard Benarus, Amir Dembo, and Ofer Zaytouni. And I thought it would be nice to try to uh, start with some introduction on, before talking about uh, rare events, about random matrices and how they can be used. Now they are used quite a lot nowadays in statistical mechanics. So actually random matrices were introduced um, by uh, Wieschart in statistics. And it was a very um, modern work actually because Wieschart was interested in random matrices already to try to uh, understand how to analyze a large array of data, of noisy data. So if you get some data and you know there is noise, how can you recover the signal? That's a big question, and this is still a very relevant question, still, and in particular nowadays with uh, neural networks, for instance, or all the problems of uh, signal recognition. So random matrices came back to light in the work of Wigner, so in physics, but so Wigner was actually well aware of the work of uh, Wieschart, and that's how he got the idea to, to use random matrices in physics. And his idea was quite different. He just thought, well, I don't know how to compute many things in, uh, about the Hamiltonian of heavy nuclei because there are lots of things going on. It's in very high dimension. 
so how can I do uh, to model it effectively? And his idea was to model everything he didn't know by randomness. And he came in this way to the idea that Hamiltonian of heavy nuclei could be approximated by large random matrices. So the questions that he addressed were a bit different from Bichard, since he was mostly interested in the distribution of the uh, eigenvalues, and in particular, the gap between the eigenvalues, because in quantum physics, uh, you know that the gap between uh, two energy levels is what you need to go from one state to the other. Uh, so this um, type of question are still very uh, modern and very active to try to understand how uh, uh, the eigenvalues of random matrices are distributed on a very local basis. How is uh, the distance between two nearest eigenvalues distributed? So that's a very uh, active topic. And as I said in the introduction, uh, there is nowadays a lot of uh, application also of random matrices in a deep neural network, so I will not talk much about it. But um, let me say that what I want to highlight in the next few slides is that uh, understanding rare events, so not only the typical behavior of random matrices, but uh, the probability that they have a different behavior can be helpful also in this kind of questions. So, now I would like to be more precise and tell you how you can uh, use random matrices in signal, signal detection and come back to Vichat and the introduction of random matrices. So Vichat was considering an array of data, so k-dimensional, and, um, and so he had an observation of this data and uh, he has a question uh, of uh, understanding the eigenvalues of this uh, matrix X times X transpose, which is called the empirical uh, covariance matrix, um, when the XI are noisy, so when they're taken at random. And uh, so, ah, uh, oops, yeah. I have to say first that there is something that you can see very easily. It's a case when a K is a finite dimension and n is going to infinity. So in this case, the entries of x, x transpose will just be the sum of the x, i, j, x, i, k. And you see that if you renormalize by the dimension n, so because you, if you assume that the entries are independent, you will just have a sum of independent variables. And if they have, for instance, finite second moment, uh, you know that this will go to zero if you are outside of the uh, diagonal, and it will go to the covariance, to the true covariance, uh, if you look at the diagonal. So in the case where k is finite and n is going to infinity, which is somehow the kind of question we will be interested in, the spectrum of x, x transpose divided by n is very simple. It's going to be a Dirac mass at the covariance. It have the same covariance, so they're all centered. Um, and, uh, and so the, the question is quite easy to solve. Now, what happens when k and n goes to infinity will be the kind of questions that we want to consider, uh, in particular nowadays, because we know that uh, we have very big data. And so this question was uh, solved um, by uh, Pastor and Marchenko uh, so a few years later. And uh, what they prove is that uh, as soon as you assume, so maybe I can use this. Yes, great. As, as soon as you assume that the ratio of k over n goes to some constant, so before it was zero, but now I will assume it goes to some constant c, which is smaller or equal to one. Otherwise I could just multiply the matrices in the opposite direction. Uh, then what I, I can uh, estimate, the number of eigenvalues which will fall in some interval so as before, it will be, uh, the interval will be proportional to n. I mean, the same normalization as when k is finite. And uh, what they proved is that the number of eigenvalues which fall in some interval a, b, a, b scale by n is going to converge towards some probability measure, which is called the Pasteur-Marchenko distribution. 
So here you have a, an explicit formula for this, uh, for this density. And you can see that uh, it has a support which is in between lambda plus and lambda minus. So lambda plus and lambda minus are related with this, uh, this ratio C. It's given by one plus or minus the square root of C. So you see that when C is zero, you recover the direct mass identity because here I assume that all uh, the entries that covariance one but otherwise, you have kind of smoothing of this kind of direct mass, and uh, which depend on, on C. Uh, what was proved a bit later was uh, that uh, if you look at the largest eigenvalue or the extreme eigenvalues, if you assume still that all your data is completely random, then the extreme eigenvalue will stick to the bulk. So this means that the largest eigenvalue will converge towards the, um, the boundary of the support. So here, so for instance, if you have this C, the largest eigenvalue will go, converge to this point and the low, smallest eigenvalue will converge to this point and this almost surely. So this will be important actually in the signal detection as we will see. So just to give you some hint of the, ah, okay. Okay, I have a problem to uh, move my slide. Okay. Even if you click on the on the slide. Ah, you are wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so so let me tell you uh, a bit what are the kind of uh, ideas which uh, which were used to this for to do this kind of uh, of theorem of convergence of the. Uh, of the distribution of the eigenvalues. So, so the idea was that uh, it was enough to compute moments. And that was somehow the, the basic ideas which go back to, to Wigner. How do you want to prove this kind of theorem? Well, here you have a very uh, uh, non-smooth function of the empirical distribution of the eigenvalues. You are counting the eigenvalues in some interval you can instead look at smoother function and then proceed by approximation of your function. So instead of taking uh, here the, um, the indicator function of the interval AB, you can take as a function of your matrix, the piece moment. The advantage of this is that it's, uh, as I'm going to show just now, it's much easier to compute moments. And so this is what uh, Pastor and Marchenko and before Wigner proved for another kind of matrices, that if you look at this moment, you can prove the convergence towards desired profile. Okay, so this was kind of the idea. And the proof for this is just based on the fact that when you look at moments, you can just expand the matrix product in terms of the entries. And um, you will get a big sum of uh, indices so the I1, I2P go from one, so to N or K, depending on uh, whether they are odd or even in this case. Uh, but then you can compute this moment. Okay, it's a big, big thing, but you have lots of expectation which will be zero because you have lots of entries which are independent and they're centered. And, and so using that, you can eventually estimate this big sum and look at the main contribution when K and N goes to infinity. So that's basically how you prove the convergence. This idea actually is still very much used and powerful in the world of random matrices. So for instance, you can improve this convergence by looking at the covariance. So instead of looking at the expectation here, you could look at the covariance of this guy and show that it goes to zero like one over n squared. So this is enough to prove almost true convergence. And uh, you could also improve your estimate to show that you have equivalence uh, when P is going to infinity with N. And this allows you to uh, control the largest eigenvalue, for instance, okay? Because the norm, if, you, if P is going to infinity faster than log N, this trace will be dominated by the moment of the largest eigenvalue. So using this kind of information, you can actually prove uh, this theorem I just stated. 
Okay, so let's now uh, go a bit uh, deeper in the problem of uh, signal recognition. And so let's imagine now that instead of taking uh, all the entries which are noise, which are independent variables, you have you add some signal. Okay, so you you have a one-dimensional vector u which is fixed, deterministic. Eventually, you multiply it by a Gaussian variable, or could be something else, with some intensity, and then you add noise. So, so the game here that you are uh, seeing, computing, measuring xi, and you would like to retrieve u. OK, and the question you would like to know first is if you look at the tree x, which is uh, vector, so you have n of them, so you have n observation of this k-dimensional uh, vector. So can you see uh, from just looking at the spectrum of x, x transpose, that there was a signal? OK, and so this question was raised by Bike, Benamus, and Peche. And what they prove is that, so if this row is uh, too small, so it's smaller than square root of c, where c, you remember, is this uh, limit of the ratio k over n, then the larger singular value will converge almost surely towards the uh, boundary of the bulk, so the, the same limit as if rho was zero. So the idea is that if your signal is not strong enough, the largest eigenvalue will have the same behavior as if you don't have any signal. However, if the signal is strong enough, then the largest eigenvalue will go farther. Okay, so actually it will go to one plus rho times one plus c over rho. Okay, so the idea then is that somehow you, if you just look at the eigenvalue, if the signal is strong enough, it will, it will move uh, the largest eigenvalue. That's uh, the, what is called the BBP transition. And in fact, uh, so you can use this property to detect a signal. So namely, if rho is greater than this uh, critical value, the signal can be detected. And actually, there is weak recovery in the sense that you can find at least that uh, the larger the, the eigenvector related with the larger eigenvalue of x x transpose is somehow aligned with u. So the scalar product is, uh, is not going to zero. So you have some kind of weak recovery. But uh, actually, it seems it, it appears that it is kind of optimal statement in the sense that if this signal is too small, so if rho is smaller than this critical value, then it was first prove that there is no test based on the eigenvalue which can reliably detect the signal. OK, maybe here I should actually uh, emphasize that if we looked at the larger eigenvalue, it's because if this is a one dimensional perturbation of, of, uh, of the first matrix, which is only noise, then by vial interlacing uh, property, all the eigenvalue of xi and wi will be, well, x and w. So x is made of the colon vector xi and w of the colon vector uh, yi, wi. Uh, then the eigenvalue of xi on, of x on w will be interlaced. So more or less, it's the, all the spectrum will have the same kind of limiting shape, OK? But what can happen is that the largest or the smallest eigenvalue will go out of the bulk. So this is really the content of the BBP transition. And so if you look at other eigenvalues at the largest eigenvalue, it's clear that you will hardly see anything. So that's why it's kind of uh, natural to look just at the largest eigenvalue. And so what, what was proven by Montanari, Reichmann, and Zaituni is that, in fact, if you just look at the eigenvalue, you won't be able to detect the signal if it's too small with respect to the noise. And it was even proved later that yeah, there is no test at all which can reliably detect the signal. So there is a true transition which is related with this uh, BBP transition to detect the signal. And uh, then you can, uh, you can uh, build tests uh, to actually do this detection. And uh, one way to do that is by using the generalized likelihood test. So 
again, you look at the same problem. So here I add this sigma, but okay, it's a covariance. You can imagine it's one. And, um, and so you want to test the hypothesis that there is a signal or there is no signal, okay? So one way to, to do that is to build an estimator. And this is a generalized likelihood ratio, which uh, is defined, okay, as the supremum uh, of uh, the probability under the hypothesis t equal one, that there is a signal of the density of x knowing uh, u and sigma, divided by the supremum of the density of the law of x, so here it should be the same x, uh, when uh, there is no under the hypothesis that there is no signal, okay? And the idea is that uh, you will reject the hypothesis A0, so you will say that uh, there is a signal if uh, this, um, uh, AC, this ratio is greater than some value, and this value, you choose it so that the probability that um, that you reject, uh, you reject a hypothesis A0 is small enough for some fixed alpha. Okay, so that's quite a reasonable thing to do. Oh. Okay, it's, uh, it's uh, again, uh, Yeah, I don't know why it's again for that. No. So can you click at the bottom where you have a little arrow? At the bottom? At the bottom of the slide. There is a little arrow pointing right. No, on the right, bottom right. Ah, now it's uh, again, okay. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why it's... Uh... Okay, yes. So, so this was the construction of this test. So you are going to look at this quantity and you are going to say that if this uh, quantity is greater than some threshold, then you have a signal, otherwise you don't. And uh, the nice point is that if you assume that your noise, W and G are uh, Gaussian, uh, then you can compute uh, this uh, generalized likelihood ratio. And this is actually a nice function of the largest eigenvalue of XX transpose and the trace of XX transpose. Okay, so somehow you see that it's not far from, uh, well, it depends only on the spectrum of XX transpose. And, uh, and because of the BBP transition, you can see that this quantity will converge um, towards, uh, so either the, 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 the boundary of the bulk, if, um, if E of rho is smaller than square root of C, and otherwise it, it will go out of the bulk and it will converge to a larger uh, quantity, which is one plus rho, times one plus C over rho. Okay, so that's good. So you see that this, this uh, kind of, uh, this test is a kind of uh, related to the previous uh, transition. And uh, finally, you can uh, compute this quantity uh, zeta n just by uh, look decided. So what you see that somehow your test is more or less uh, driven by the larger second value. And so you see that uh, zeta n will be chosen to be somehow close to the limit, to, to, to its limit, which will be phi of one uh, of, uh, of the larger second, of the boundary of the support of uh, V-sharp matrices. Okay, so when you don't have any, any noise. Okay, so you can compute this by studying the fluctuation of this guy uh, next to its limit. And this is done by using Tracy with Umlo because this test mostly depends on the larger second value. So what is Tracy with Umlo? So Tracy with Umlo is the limit of the distribution of the fluctuation of the larger second value of um, uh, V-sharp matrices. And so the story of this kind of result is a uh, it's very nice and actually it's now kind of complete. So it was initiated in the, the 90s by Tracy and Woodham, who consider the case where the, the noise, so the entries are Gaussian. 
So in, in this case, you have kind of a very explicit uh, joint law of the eigenvalues. And so you can use a specific computation to uh, related with orthogonal po polynomial to get uh, the asymptotic uh, distribution of the fluctuations. And then there was a series of work, uh, starting with uh, Eder, Xiao, and Dev Coters, and then Tao and Wu, uh, culminating with a, a paper by Ding and Yang, who obtained the uh, optimal assumption, to show that as soon as you take a matrix with uh, independent uh, entries, uh, who are centered on with covariance one and finite first moment, then uh, the fluctuation of the largest again value will be given by this uh, distribution function, which corresponds to the okay. This, uh, if I come back, if I can, yes. So if I come back to this, uh, you have to think that uh, Ln under P0 will convert to the phi of the largest again value uh, in the case where you have no, um, no signal. So it will just be this one plus uh, square root of C square. And uh, to design this zeta n as a function of alpha, you will just plug the fluctuation of this guy. And this is described by the uh, tracing with the Okay, so all is good. And now if I want to come to large deviations, so large deviations uh, answer a kind of slightly different question, which is what is the probability that we were wrong? So again, we did this test saying that our, if our estimator is too big, then you reject, you reject at H0. So this means you decide that there is a signal, but what is the probability that you decided that there is no signal under the probability that there is a signal. Okay, so what is the probability that you made the wrong decision? And this typically is a, a, the question of estimating rare events, because when you have a signal, what we saw is that at least if rho is big enough, this quantity will not converge towards uh, the limit under P0. And so we have to estimate the probability that this quantity takes uh, and uh, an untypical uh, value. So re we have to estimate the probability of rare events. Okay, and so this is kind of the first uh, appearance of the problem of understanding what uh, rare events. So in this direction, I would like to uh, show you, uh, well, to cite some, some other uh, interests of um, large deviations in this uh, signal recognition, uh, recognition program. And so this is in a paper by Benavus, May, Montanari, and Nika. And so they consider the same kind of problem as before, but now you observe, so a matrix with this noise plus a tensor. Okay, so your signal has the form of a tensor. And uh, by the same kind of uh, argument as before, you can imagine that so if lambda is too small, the largest eigenvalue of this guy will converge, will have the same limit as the, um, as the largest eigenvalue of the, of the matrix without noise, without signal. Uh, but if lambda is big, big enough, so bigger than some lambda k, which depends on k, then the largest eigenvalue will pop up to some finite value. Okay, and so you could say, well, uh, I, when lambda is greater than this lambda k, I can easily retrieve my original u. At least weekly, I can find some vector which will not be too far from a u. And it turns out that it's not so easy when k is large. In fact, there is no polynomial time algorithm uh, when c, when lambda is smaller than n to the k minus two divided by four. So in the case where k is greater or equal to three, there is a big, uh, uh, there, there is a large collection of lambda for which you know that a priori the largest eigenvalue uh, should, should pop out of your spectrum and it should be easy uh, to, um, to find out this u, but in fact, it's not so easy. 
And one way to, to try to, to recover this U uh, would be the following. So you would like to find a U, an estimator of, of U, which only depends on Y, so that you know that, for instance, the scalar product of this estimator. Uh, oop. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, this estimator, so the scalar product with U is at least bonded from below. So that's kind of a natural uh, thing you would like to do. And to do that, the natural thing would be to say, well, I look at this function Y and I want to find uh, when lambda is very big, uh, I imagine that the second term, the signal will take over and if I if I look at the signal, uh, if I look at the function f of sigma, which will be the scalar product of y with uh, sigma to the tensorial k, then uh, at least when lambda is big enough, if I try to find the optimizer, optimizer of this function, it should be close, not too far from you. Okay, that's somehow the the way you you can think about this problem. And the problem is that maximizing this type of question is NPR if k is greater than four, than three. So, okay, so so it's uh, it's not uh, such a good idea. But so what uh, the author did was to say, well, maybe I should keep that like this. How can I maximize this function? Uh, well, what I can do is a typically a gradient descent. And uh, to do that, a good thing would be to understand how I uh, distributed the critical point of my function. And so what they did was to compute actually the expectation of the number of critical points. Yeah. So the, the critical point are just, if you look at the, and the, the number of critical points is just a sum of all the possible sigma where the gradient of your function vanishes. And you may uh, look at them conditionally to, to have some scalar product with the original vector u and where the conditionally to the some value for your function. And so what they could do then is uh, to uh, compute the expectation of this number of critical points and this allowed them somehow to analyze how the number of critical points can blow up. So in particular, when k is greater than three, they could see that even though you have only uh, one, uh, one, one minima, uh, that you could have a, a lot of critical points. And this would be the reason why uh, the algorithm would, make, would take so much time to, to converge to this uh, minima. So that's kind of the, the computation they, they did. And uh, the idea to do this computation was to use a rice formula and uh, to, to get the estimates, you need actually to uh, use large deviation estimates. Okay, so that's kind of uh, some, uh, some way to motivate uh, the study of, um, of rare events in uh, kind of modern statistics. Uh, so let me uh, now kind of uh, switch G, G and, um, and consider, uh, come back and redefine what are our deviations. And now I will try to tell you about uh, what we know about large deviations in random matrix theory. Of course, it will be very focused and I will focus on the large deviation for the larger second value. Even though I could also consider the large deviation for uh, the empirical measure of for other quantities. So the basic problem of large deviation is that, for instance, so if we, you look, so here I represented the semicircle law. So the semicircle law uh, describes the limit behavior of the spectrum of uh, what we call Wigner matrices. So these are uh, symmetric matrices with uh, IID centered on trees above the diagonal. So IID independent uh, and equally distributed, for instance, with covariance one over N. And uh, we looked as before uh, for V-sharp matrices or empirical covariance matrices to 
the uh, empirical distribution of the second values, which are just, so if you look at the function of the lambda i, you sum them and you renormalize by one over n. Okay, so that's uh, the uh, evaluation of the empirical measure of the gain value against a smooth function f. Okay, and what we know as for Pasteur and Marchenko, so but this was due to Wigner, that this converges almost surely towards one value. And all, also by Comerge 4D, you can see that the larger second value will converge towards the boundary of the support. And uh, the question we would like to ask is, uh, so what is the probability that we observe something totally different? So here, instead of the uh, semicircle distribution, you would like to understand what is the probability that, for instance, your empirical measure has this kind of strange shape, or that uh, your larger second value takes a much uh, bigger value. So this, is, uh, this can be expressed in terms of the question of the probability that your empirical measure is close to some measure mu, which is not uh, the, uh, the semicircle law. Similarly, the probability that uh, the larger second value is close to some value x, which is much bigger than two. Okay, so the, the point with this type of question is that it's quite um, complicated. One of the reasons why it's complicated is that it's very model dependent. So even when you look at uh, different uh, question, for instance, the empirical measure of uh, independent, uh, um, independent uh, variables, uh, you know that the, the large deviation to the probability of rare events is uh, related with uh, the underly underlying probability, and this is given by Shannon or Boltzmann entropy. And uh, similarly, if you look at the uh, maximum of, uh, of uh, independent entries. So, so for instance, the, the approach that uh, is usually uh, followed when you look at the central limit theorem, which is by universality and kind of Lindenberg theorem uh, cannot hold. So that's the reason that for some, for some time there were only this result, which concerns Gaussian matrices again, because in the case of a Gaussian entries, as, as we will see, there are explicit formula for the joint distribution of the eigenvalue. And from there, it's not so difficult uh, to obtain a large deviation estimates. Then there was a very nice breakthrough paper that I will tell you about, which showed that if uh, the entries have uh, heavier tails than Gaussian, uh, then for instance, if they are alpha stable, or uh, even less, I mean, if they are exponential and recentered, uh, then uh, the, um, the, the proof is that the, the large deviation could be uh, uh, computed in this case both for the empirical measure and also for the larger second value. And uh, the question which remained open is what happens if the entries are sub -Gaussian? So you have a tail which is bounded by the tail of the Gaussian. And what I will uh, try to show you is that in this case, we, can, uh, we have some work uh, concerning uh, the large deviation for the larger second value but there is still quite a lot of work to be done also for the empirical measure. Okay, so let me show you why uh, Gaussian ensembles, why the matrices with Gaussian entries are so nice. And uh, I will consider uh, just, um, so Gaussian orthogonal or unitary ensembles. So rather than this cova empirical covariance, but everything could be said, could be treated similarly for um, empirical covariance matri matrices. And so I look at these matrices, which are self-adjoint. Uh, they are n by n, and they have Gaussian entries, which are centered with covariance one over n. Uh, real if beta is equal to one, and complex if beta equal to two. And in the case beta equal to one, I have to change a bit the covariance on the diagonal to make sure that the distribution, the joint distribution is given uh, by this formula. So the covariance is fitted so that um, the, 
the density, um, the density of the, the entries is just given by the tri trace of x squared. And so the nice thing with this uh, distribution is that if you look at your matrix and you multiply it left and right by uh, by a unitary matrix and it's conjugate. So if you conjugate it by a unitary matrix, then the distribution will be invariant, okay? Simply because the trace of X square will be invariant by the section as well as the Jacobian, the change of the change of variable. And using this, uh, you can see that the joint distribution of the eigenvalue, when you do the change of variable, which change Xn into the eigenvalue, so the diagonal entry, the, the entries of D, the diagonal matrix. And you, you can see that the joint law of the eigenvalue of this matrix X is given by this uh, Gaussian weight here, times a Jacobian, which gives you a Coulomb gas type of uh, weight. Okay, so this is a Van der Maan determinant. So this is the only example of matrices where we have such a nice joint law because of course, in general, any other matrix, the law of the eigenvalues and the law of the eigenvectors will uh, depend on each other. They will not be independent. So from, the, from such a formula, you can easily try to derive a large deviation estimates. And so this is, uh, what we did a long time ago with Gerard Benarus. So we looked at the empirical measures of the eigenvalues. And uh, what we proved is that uh, the law of this guy satisfies a large deviation principle. So what does it mean? It's written just here. It means that if we look at the probability that the empirical measure is in some set A, okay, so it will be bounded from below by minus the infimum of some array function over the interior of A. And it will be bounded above by the same thing, but you take the infimum over the closure of A. Okay. And so the, the idea is that somehow the probability that, so if you take A to be a small ball around some measure mu, the probability that you are in this ball will be approximately given by exponential. So here it will be minus n squared times the rate function uh, taken at mu. So what is this rate function here? So this rate function is this nice uh, formula that uh, you have kind of quadratic term coming from the Gaussian uh, density. And then you have another term, a repulsive term coming from uh, the Jacobian. So how do we prove this kind of things? Uh, as I just said, what we need to prove is that the probability that your empirical measure is close to some measure is given by exponential n squared times the rate function at this measure mu. And this uh, can be done more or less by Laplace method in this case, because if you go back to, oops, if you go back to your formula, so you have the density of your eigenvalues. You can put everything in the exponential. You're trying to estimate this density when your empirical measure is close to some measure new. And in fact, you can see that this density is, is nearly a function of the empirical measure. So when you put everything, you will have beta sum of log of lambda i minus lambda j. So this is approximately the integral of the log of x minus y under your empirical measure. And here, this is also the integral of x squared under your empirical measure. So based on that, you see that if your empirical measure is, is close to some mu, well, your density is more or less fixed. And from which you can get this type of estimates. So this would be by Laplace method. Okay, the only thing that you have really to take care of is that this function is not really smooth. So you don't really have the right to apply Laplace method, but you can imagine that you can do this kind of estimates. Uh, if you want to look at the largest eigenvalue, it's a bit 
uh, the same story for the Gaussian ensemble, you can look at the density of the law of the largest eigenvalue. You just integrate the previous formula and all other eigenvalues. So you will get some interaction of your largest eigenvalue with the other, uh, the smaller eigenvalue. But again, if you put this in the exponential, you will get exponential beta sum of the log of lambda i minus x. And because you imagine that uh, the, the empirical measure of the lambda i under the smaller system will also converge to the same limit as before, and it will converge with a very uh, large probability, since the probability that you are not close to the semicircle law will be of order exponential minus n squared. So this is neglectable here in the large deviation for these guys, which are just of order n. And therefore, you can replace this interaction with all the other uh, smaller eigenvalue by the semicircle law. Okay, so again, kind of Laplace is kind of very uh, easy to see. But again, what can you do in the general case? And uh, this was only a few, quite a few years later that um, Charles Bordenave and Pietro Caputo had the idea to consider the case of what they call tails heavier than Gaussian. Okay. So in which case we are going to see that in fact, we, we don't need uh, exact formula for the density to compute rare events. And uh, what, what do they mean by this? So they mean that if they look at the probability that, so this is one entry, okay? The, you have to think that the, the, the entries are divided by square root of n. So this is really the size of uh, one entry. The, this is really the, um, the probability distribution of, uh, of each entry. So if you look at the probability that this is great, they assume that it's going to zero when t is going to infinity, like exponential minus a times t alpha, where alpha is strictly smaller than two. Okay, so a Gaussian variable will satisfy this property, but with alpha is equal to two. And here you assume that you have something which is going to zero uh, more slowly, strictly more slowly. And what they prove is that in this case, when you estimate a rare event, the probability of rare event, you don't have the same uh, speed. Instead of, uh, of having a speed n square as before, you will see that the law of the empirical measure satisfies the large deviation principle, but in the speed n1 plus alpha over two. And if you look at the larger second value of your matrix, well, it can go away with a probability which is much larger. It's of order exponential minus n alpha over two. And of course, in both cases, uh, they have the exact rate function. So this was kind of a miracle, but the miracle has some mathematical reason that somehow you can understand how to create rare events. So namely, if you look at, um, at your entry of your matrix, so the probability that it is of order one is going to be of the order exponential minus a times t alpha n alpha over two. And in fact, exactly because of what we have seen before, if we have only one entry, so a rank one deformation of a matrix, we have some change to change the spectrum, to change at least the larger second value. We know that if, if it's big enough, the larger second value will pop out with probability one uh, of the spectrum. And that's somehow the idea that to create a, a large uh, eigenvalue, this type of matrix, the best thing that you have to do is to create a few big entries. Okay, one or finitely many. And this will have probability of this order. Okay, so you see that it's, uh, it is, what I'm saying is not optimal a priori, but actually Fanny Ogeri showed that this kind of strategy is optimal and you can get exactly the rate by optimizing over this kind of strategies. Similarly, if you want to change uh, the empirical measure, then it's not enough to change uh, one or finitely many entries. You need to change at least of order n, okay? Because otherwise, 
again, by this interlacing of the eigenvalue, you are not going to change uh, the empirical measure. But what Pietro Caputo and uh, Charles Borden have showed is that if you want to change uh, the empirical measure, it's enough to change about n uh, entries in your n square uh, array uh, to change uh, the to change the, the empirical measure, and so you get this rate, which is now n times uh, n alpha over two, which gives you the idea of how you change uh, you create the deviations. Okay, I think I have to. Uh, go a bit faster. Actually, how much time do I have still? Um, yeah, something like five, six minutes, but... Um, yeah. Okay, so yeah. I, I will do it. Ten minutes is good. <laughs> okay, so so just, uh, so, so now the big question which was open is how to, what can you do when you don't have uh, uh, Gaussian or Eviter or heavier than, uh, than Gaussian? And so the, this was some work with, uh, with Jonathan Husson, my student. And so what we, we introduced a criterion about uh, what is a sub-Gaussian uh, tail, just by saying that, well, it's sub-Gaussian if you can bound the Laplace transform of your measure by the Laplace transform of the Gaussian, and you have here a constant A. And we say that we have sharp sub-Gaussian tail if and only if we can take A equal to 1. And you can see that actually you have not so many uh, probability measures which satisfy this, but the Rademacher law and the uniform measure, for instance, satisfies this inequality. And so what we prove in this case is that uh, there is kind of universality of the large deviation for the largest eigenvalue in the sense that it would satisfy the same large deviation principle. But the fact that A is equal to one is actually uh, very important because so what we saw uh, later with uh, Fanny Ogeri is that if now we A is strictly bigger than one, so we don't have the, this uh, sharp uh, uh, sub bound. Actually, we said sharp because of course, when you look at uh, T close to zero, you see that A has to be greater than one. Actually here, I think I forgot the two, okay. And so what we proved is that if uh, A is greater than one, then we have large deviation estimates, but only for deviation above some threshold. And the rate function is not a Gaussian one. Uh, however, there is kind of a transition. We can prove that if this A is not too big, then for X small enough, we have the large deviation estimates, which are the same as the Gaussian. So there is this kind of transition in between uh, the two uh, mechanisms that is still uh, not completely understood, but you see that there is a kind of transition between the Gaussian behavior and the heavy tail. Okay, so here I will go a bit fast, just to say that um, it's possible to generalize these results, for instance, in, to the case where uh, the matrix uh, is not IID, but of covariance which depends on the site. And this was, uh, for instance, unknown even in the case where uh, the entries are Gaussian, because again, in this case, you don't have a joint uh, distribution for the eigenvalues. Uh, it's also possible to uh, do this kind of estimate when you have uh, a matrix which is as what we considered before a noisy matrix plus a finite dimensional perturbation. So you can again do large deviation, but actually in this case, we need to have a Gaussian, mat Gaussian matrices J. So we don't know how to prove the universality even if we have sharp sub Gaussian entries. And uh, I wanted to say a word, maybe I can say a word on, on, on the idea of the proof. Uh, so the idea is that it's, uh, it depends, uh, the, the idea is to make a tilt with respect to what we call spherical integral. So you can think a bit about the spherical integral as some kind of Fourier transform on matrices. So it takes your matrix and it gives you some quantity which will only depend on the spectrum uh, of your matrix. And in some, uh, in some way it's kind of Fourier transform. And uh, 
And so this is our basic, um, our central tool. And uh, what we could do is to estimate this kind of, uh, of quantity. So as I said, it will only depend on the spectrum because you integrate here over the uniform law on the sphere. And uh, in fact, we could uh, obtain the asymptotic of this quantity with a Millen MIDA and show that it depends on the limiting spectral measure of X, uh, but also on the largest second value of your matrix X. So if theta is big enough, this will depend on the larger second value. And you can imagine that in fact, when theta is very big, this will be more or less of the equivalent to exponential n theta times the larger second value. So that's somehow the idea. And, um, and using this idea, so maybe I should not, uh, maybe, well, maybe I can just say, well, the using this idea, uh, this, uh, this quantity, the idea is to change your measure. So here it's not that you are going to construct the optimal state to create your deviation, but you are going to change your measure. That under your new measure, you are going to have the desired, uh, the desired deviation. And so this is what we do. And uh, we get an, an upper bound on, on the lower bound by showing that this kind of transformation uh, is such that um, your, uh, your transform uh, measure will satisfy the desired deviation. Okay, I'm not going since I'm out of time. Uh, I would ju just like to uh, highlight a few organization on open problem. So, so there was quite a lot of work in this direction. So to generalize the kind of model that we can treat. Uh, there are still quite a lot of questions which are open. Uh, for instance, to complete the large deviation principle when you don't have sharp subversion on trees, but also uh, to complete, for instance, the large deviation when you have uh, violence depending matrices. The question of the, of the deviation for the empirical measure is uh, still uh, completely open. And we don't expect that uh, this large deviation will be universal. For instance, if you take Randmacher on trees, uh, you can see that the probability that your empirical measure is close to a direct mass at zero is bounded from below by one over two times n squared, because you, it's the probability that you just have, let's say, plus one in your matrix. Uh, but the rate function for this guy is infinite so in the Gaussian case. So you don't have universality and it's uh, unclear uh, yet how to approach this kind of question of the large deviation for this uh, for Wigner matrices with uh, independent trend maker on trees. But uh, we have started to, to implement our uh, approach with the spherical integrals to this, uh, this kind of problems uh, for simpler model, which are unitarily invariant. Okay, so sorry, I was a bit uh, delayed and thank you very much for your attention. Yes, thank you, Alice. Uh, thank you for making clear the logical lines of thoughts and uh, giving all the ideas of the proof. It, uh, I really enjoyed that. So I'd like to um, invite people to raise their hands if they have a question. So hopefully I will get to see uh, this raised hand. And uh, just to warm up maybe the floor for additional question. Um, so in your title, you had applications. Could you tell us, tell us a bit more about the general, I mean, gen, general words about the application that you've been involved with? Well, when I talked about applications, I was, uh, so, yeah, I was thinking about the first part where I tried to, to highlight how random matrices could be used. Um, I thought also people here in this conference, in this audience, would be more interested by applications, so I did my best <laughs> to motivate people. Um, and so ba basically, uh, yeah, basically, I think that this uh, signal uh, recognition question that I talked about at the beginning is, uh, uh, is very much um, present now in, uh, in lots of mathematics. I mean, Lots of mathematics are now uh, considering deep neural networks and all the problems related to them. Uh, in these games, uh, random matrices are quite important because, uh, for instance, they model the synapses in neural networks and so on. Uh, but usually, people are not so much interested in relevance. But so, what I try to highlight is that, for instance, in this problem of uh, 
understanding the gradient descent uh, by, by understanding the uh, critical points of random functions, uh, you, you have this kind of questions we show. Uh, yeah, but, but, but I, I would not, uh, okay, maybe I, I, I was a bit, uh, a, a bit too vague, but I, I will not say that I'm working a lot on applications. I would say that my, my, my ERC has some, uh, some part which is related with all this problem in statistical learnings, uh, which are related. So, yeah, so that's also another direction. So in statistical learning, uh, you, you try to, well, this kind of, of question that you have this kind of uh, ratio estimators, but with much more complicated uh, probability measures. And uh, you try to, to estimate this kind of objects, and sometimes it's related with, uh, with random matrices with, in a more complicated way than, than there. And there you may need large deviation uh, uh, tools as well to, to estimate these kind of objects. Yeah. So, um, so yes. I mean, uh, yeah. So in statistical learning, there are quite a few questions which which are related with on the matrices on eventually rare items. Well, thank you. So I don't know if it's um, some setting or uh, that are wrong or not. I'm not seeing any raised hands. So unless somebody else among the organizer tells me that uh, this is uh, not the case, maybe I'll just um, well, maybe I'll uh, have to thank you once again for your talk. And, You're uh, welcome. And uh, thanks again for the invitation. Thank you to a, a, a next um, event, a real live event. <laughs> I hope so. Thank you. All right. Thanks. So, Edward, maybe um, you could uh, turn on your camera and um, Maybe share your slides. And while you do that, maybe I'll, uh, I'll introduce you. Okay. So Edward Saf is a professor of mathematics at Vanderbilt University. Is, the, is, leading, is in leading there the Center for Constructive Approximation and has been the co-editor and co-founder of the Constructive Approximation Journal for 20 years. Is the co-author of nine books on his topics of research, namely complex and numerical analysis, approximation and potential theory. The last book appeared like in 2019. So among the many distinctions Ed has received, I will only mention that he was back in 1978, a Guggenheim Fellow, and now he's a Fellow of the American Math Society. Well, there would be much to say on his uh, services and the honors he received, but uh, I will um, rather make more space for his talk on the point configuration in short range interaction. And this is actually just in time for when the slides are ready. So Ed, please, the floor is yours. Okay, well, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, I, uh, I wonder if you can see my background. Uh, can you see me talking as well? Yes, we can see you talking and we see this nice skyline. Okay, well, uh, okay, so I'll start off by saying uh, that it's a real pleasure to uh, be here uh, at the 2020 FOCM convention, uh, which is uh, in, as you can well see, Vancouver. So uh, that is to say, it's great to be here virtually and uh, I am um, really sorry I couldn't, couldn't see it uh, in person because as you notice the sphere, I hope you can see the sphere in the background, 
and uh, it, it, the lights uh, on that sphere. So that, that has some relevance to this talk that I'm about to give, namely uh, uh, point distributions on a sphere, their tessellations as is shown on my first slide here. So uh, with that, um, I will uh, want to first acknowledge uh, my co-authors in this uh, most recent study. Uh, the first is uh, Doug Hardin. Doug uh, has been a colleague of mine at Vanderbilt. And this, in fact, marks our 20th year working together. And uh, so I think it, it's um, worth saying at this time in public <laughs> that it's been a real pleasure uh, working with him uh, he has infinite patience and lots of great uh, ideas, and I hope we can go on uh, working together for many more years in the future. Um, and uh, my other co-author here is uh, Alex Vlasiuk. Uh, he was a uh, PhD student of Doug and mine, and currently is at Florida University, uh, completing a a postdoc there after which he will come back to Vanderbilt for a year so we can finish some projects uh, together. And after that, we'll be on the market uh, for a tenure track position. So this is a little bit of a, an advertisement for him that uh, he would make uh, certainly uh, an excellent um, hire for, for such a purpose. So please keep that in mind in future. Anyway, um, uh, as with uh, a number of uh, graduate students um, uh, of my past, I, I've uh, started to collaborate with them. I, it reminds me uh, of uh, the old joke about, um, you know, one of these never die jokes, such as, uh, oh, mathematicians never die, they simply lose some of their functions. So um, I'm sure you've heard that before. But uh, for me, my version is that um, uh, past uh, PhD students and postdocs never die. They just become some of your best collaborators uh, and in some cases, even teachers. So let's uh, get started with uh, where we're headed here. Um, and that's the goal. Uh, uh, the general goal, um, which is to study point configurations. So we have particles. Um, I want to think of them as particles or points. There are capital N of them. They're uh, contained in some uh, set A in Euclidean space. And their behavior is governed by some very general functional at the moment, uh, which I denote by this bold E uh, of omega N. And, may depend as well on the set A. And what we're interested in are kind of equilibrium configurations. That is, we want to minimize this uh, functional over all endpoint subsets of A, over all omega, such omega Ns. Uh, and we will assume that, that E is, is lower semi-continuous and A is compact, so such a minimum indeed exists. Now, sometimes it's more uh, convenient and more appropriate to deal with uh, uh, a maximum, uh, maximizing our function rather than minimizing, because there's no loss in generality working with the min since we can just use minus signs. Uh, but uh, there are a couple of examples where we'll particularly use maximum, uh, which I'll talk to you about in a minute. Now, this goal is way too broad to say anything uh, really general, but but uh, I'd like to um, emphasize certain areas of that goal, and that's to develop large N uh, asymptotics, um, and especially for what uh, we call short range functionals, E, short range functionals. So we heard a lot in the last talk about large N asymptotics, um, and we'll hear a little bit more in this talk as well. So what do I mean by uh, a, a short range functional? It basically means if you have two compact sets, A and B, they say they're disjoint, so they're positively separated. And uh, we compute uh, 
uh, the functional at a, on a collection of points, some of which are in a set A, some of which are in the disjoint set B. Uh, we compute that functional and uh, look at it in an asymptotic sense. So what is the asymptotic sense here? N, the number of particles goes to infinity. Then uh, what we're saying by being short range is that the interactions between points A and, uh, and points B, between the points from A and B together uh, are negligible compared to the interactions within each set. So here, you, that's indicated by this uh, limit here, where the denominator is uh, concerns the functional evaluated uh, at a set of n points in A union B, and here uh, the sum of their involvements on A uh, uh, directly and in B directly. So, so there's not the cross interactions are negligible as n gets large. So that's the essential feature. So I want to give a bunch of examples because uh, uh, part of the idea of the proof uh, of, the, of this talk, in fact, and the proofs is, is to provide uh, some general result that can work in several situations which heretofore have been somewhat uh, 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 investigated rather separately. So the first I want to talk about, and some of you I'm sure have heard me talk a bit about this, is, is the is the energy is a, a functional, which is an energy functional. In this case, it's a reciprocal distance uh, functional, which uh, where we just look at uh, the interactions between uh, or distance between pairs of points in omega n. We take their distance, raise it to a power s, take the reciprocal and sum it. So um, this uh, uh, we can do for a variety of values of s, but in particular, uh, I wanna focus on this hypersingular case where uh, s, the parameter s is bigger than or equal to the diameter of a. Uh, I like to think of that parameter s as uh, like a strength parameter. So if you notice, uh, if you have points uh, close together, say, the larger uh, is um, s, the larger is s, then uh, the smaller is that denominator and then the larger is your, your so-called s energy, e. Uh, okay, so uh, there's been a fair amount of work on this situation, the hypersingular situation. I mentioned uh, the work I, will, I had with Doug Harden. Uh, I'll talk about that in more detail. Uh, a little bit later on, uh, my former, uh, our former student, uh, Sergei Baradachev, uh, Alex, um, Sasha Reznikov, uh, uh, our colleagues uh, in uh, Leble and, and Serfati, where they worked on uh, large deviation principles with us uh, for this hypersingular case, looking at considering hypersingular gases. Uh, Arno Coilars and Apologize to Martinez Finkelstein for for uh, uh, running out of room on my slide. So uh, that's what that notation stands for. And uh, Victor Mimescu and there are a number of others. So that is one type of problem that we want to to review and, and talk about, and its connection with other problems. So so one of the things wrong with this hyper singular, I, maybe not wrong, but is a problem with the hyper singular. Reese S energy is that uh, any computation of it is of order n squared. It's costly, it's of order n squared for n points. And so uh, to make this, uh, cut this problem down the size, what we can do is try to truncate uh, that energy. That is to say, uh, for instead of taking this double sum over i and j, well, uh, we'll take a single sum over i. And the idea is that for a given uh, point xi, we only look at its k nearest neighbors. The set of such points is denoted here by i sub ik, and the set of the, those indices for k nearest neighbors, and we just sum over that. So that, that chops down the problem to uh, order n, essentially, uh, an order n problem, which is much more manageable from a computational point of view. And um, I will talk in more detail about that later, uh, there hasn't until now been some 
uh, detailed analysis, asymptotic analysis of the situation, although it has been applied before this idea by uh, Alex and uh, some of his collaborators that he met out at uh, NCAR, the National Center for Atmospheric Research. So the third is a, a very uh, uh, popular area, important area, and it deals with a quantization problem. The quantization problem, what are we talking about here? Um, well, here we uh, have some kind of weight function, eta. We have some positive fixed number, p. And uh, we take uh, the integral as shown here of this weight times this minimum over i. So for each point, for each point in A, we look at the point of our, of our uh, configuration that's closest to it, we raise that distance to the power of p, and then we integrate. So where does this come up? This comes up um, in uh, central Voronoi tessellations in the, when, when p is two, uh, something that's been investigated quite a bit by some of the names down below, uh, Du, Faber, and Gunsberger for one, and, um, uh, and in uh, the general situation uh, where it applies to say optimal transport, uh, it arises in Wasserstein distance considerations. The general theory of quantization is fundamental, so we're in a book, uh, a foundational book by Graf and Lushke. And I want to particularly sing out, single out the work of Gruber. Uh, notice the year 2004 uh, compared to the years of the papers uh, at the, in the top, the very top example. Uh, uh, there, uh, this work, uh, so this is sort of one of the, the uh, stimuli for this, this project that we worked on is that um, there are a number of, of similarities uh, between work uh, on quantization and work on uh, energy. Uh, uh, they look like quite different uh, functionals indeed, and the works on, the, on those topics have been rather separated. Uh, uh, but uh, the point of this talk is to uh, show that there are some underlying themes here and that these underlying themes can lead to a general theorem that uh, can handle all the cases. These three here, and I want to present a couple more. One is best packing, the best packing problem, classical problem of putting points on a set. How do you do that? Well, you do it in such a way uh, to optimize by maximizing the minimum pairwise distance between any pair of points. And um, in this case, uh, for the optimizers, uh, we're gonna take maximizers, not minimizers. So these WN stars, those will always be uh, uh, what we call the uh, optimal configurations, okay? So uh, classical work, uh, best packing on the sphere. The original problem goes back to Tomas as a, a botanist and uh, Feyer's Toth uh, Hobbitch and Van der Veer, and these are all very, very old uh, uh, contributions, important ones, of course. But uh, there's not enough room to put the most the most recent on here. Um, again, uh, this situation will be uh, covered by by the general theorem that we'll, we're going to propose. And the last uh, example that uh, we'll talk about is the so-called person strang mesh generation algorithm. Uh, again, that 2004 keeps popping up. So that was a, that was a good year um, uh, and very much responsible for this talk. And here, uh, the idea is uh, to generate a mesh, generate points, um, uh, and by starting with a, a Delaunay uh, graph, so the points or vertices are omega n, the collection of its edges uh, is capital E. Uh, you look at, um, for a given index I, that is a given point in that Delaunay triangulation, you look at all those edges that are connected to uh, XI. And I, I know we, the collection of those edges uh, or, or indices are, are, is denoted by T sub I. 
you fix a constant p, and then it's a rather messy functional here uh, that is described uh, uh, in this way and involves uh, a quantity called m sub two of omega n. And what is that? It's just the average of the square lengths of the edges in your DLNA triangulation. And uh, the concept uh, of this uh, generation is to um, kind of think of putting springs between the vertices uh, in your DLNA tri uh, triangul uh, triangulation. And uh, thinking of the, think of those springs uh, not so completely in the usual way, because we're only going to allow uh, uh, repulsion uh, of the springs. And uh, then um, uh, create, uh, then maximize over all possible uh, endpoint configurations. And uh, up to now, uh, there has not been any asymptotics on the behavior of such a, a mesh generation algorithm. So, so uh, we'll, we'll be able to provide some of that uh, toward the end of the talk. So uh, I, what I've given here uh, are five examples and just about all of them I think can be generalized to include some multiplicative uh, weight function. We, we saw that for quantization, but it can be included in the Reese case as well, as well as uh, an external field or you can have both. So, so uh, these examples can be generalized at least in that way and fit within the theme. So uh, to get a, a good sense, a better sense perhaps, uh, hopefully of the difference between uh, uh, long range and short range uh, functionals, uh, I wanna go back to uh, the discrete energy problem some of you have heard me talk about this before, so I, I want to, uh, but I do want to go through it since it provides some basis for the general result, which I'll mention later. So, um, so what we have is, is a, a pair potential. So K, um, uh, K is a pair potential. So what is, what is a pair potential? A pair potential will uh, map uh, A cross A a cross A into uh, the reals. And uh, it is, for our purposes, it is, excuse me a second here because I'm losing power for some reason. All right, I think I'm back. Um, uh, uh, it is uh, um, lo lo lower semi-continuous. We assume it's lower semi-continuous on, on our set uh, A. So what is uh, the K energy uh, of a set of endpoints? Well, what you do is you uh, compute the interactions, the K interactions between each pair of points. Uh, we avoid duplication. So I is different from J and you just sum up all those K interactions and that's what we call the K uh, energy of That's our, our functional in this uh, situation. Uh, it may be long range, it may be short range. Okay. Uh, so then uh, the minimization problem, that what is the problem? That's the problem uh, of finding uh, an equilibrium configuration. Minimize the endpoint energy, K energy of a set A. And I, I'm going back here to uh, the notation that, that uh, I've used in, in, with my collaborators in previous papers, uh, which is to use calligraphy E sub K of A and N to denote uh, this minimum energy or energy of the equilibrium configuration. And so, as I mentioned already, omega N star, which is what we use our notation for optimizers, that's just called the K and the endpoint uh, K equilibrium configuration uh, for the set A. So these points uh, are not in general uh, unique. Uh, easy to show that. So, so one reason why I want to talk about that is uh, in an act of shameless uh, self-promotion, um, I want to uh, mention a recent book, well, it's out for about a year now, um, called Discrete Energy and Rectifiable Sets, uh, which contains a great deal of uh, our, our work that, that uh, Doug and myself uh, have done 
um, along with our, our collaborators. It contains a great deal of history of uh, these kinds of problems and has a nice uh, introduction and appendix that make it appropriate for, for a graduate course, make it easily accessible. So, so this is with uh, Sergey Baradachev and Doug and myself. Okay, so, uh, so far we talked about uh, a, a discrete problem. We're looking at optimizing points, but there is a continuous problem. And, and the only difference is there that, that we work with measures instead of distinct points. So, so the notation is this, calligraphy M of A is just a set of all probability measures with support on A, K our kernel, uh, our pair potential is symmetric and non-negative, lower semi-continuous. So very general conditions on our on, on uh, K. In fact, the symmetry can be can be ignored, uh, but it does occur in most cases. Uh, so what do I mean by the continuous energy of uh, a measure? So I'm talking about a probability measure supported on A. Well, it's just the double integral of our pair potential uh, with respect to mu cross mu. So that's denoted by I sub K of mu. And then what we want to do uh, in analogy with a discrete case is we want to minimize. So we're minimizing now these double integrals and we're minimizing them over all uh, probability measures supported on A. And that uh, number, that minimum number is called uh, the Wiener constant or sometimes called a Robin constant in two dimensions. So um, uh, uh, the, an equilibrium measure, what is that in this case? Well, it's simply, um, simply a measure that attains uh, the uh, value of our Wiener constant. It's a, it's a measure who's such that the, the uh, continuous energy, K energy of it is minimum, okay? Now, um, this red part at the bottom, I hope you can all see that um, uh, on the screen. Uh, shout out if you can't, this is a good time to shout out. Um, uh, but uh, it is possible that uh, you minimize uh, this double integral uh, and you get infinity for your answer, for your Wiener constant, okay? Um, sometimes this is described by saying the K capacity of your set A is equal to zero. And, and if that happens, what does that mean? That means no matter what probability measure you plug in to this double integral, you get infinity. So what is, what is a minimizer? <laughs> well, every, every measure is a minimizer. Every measure is an equilibrium measure. Now, some, some authors uh, prefer just to say there is no equilibrium, but um, uh, uh, to my, uh, I, I believe this is, this is a, a more appropriate approach for what I'll be talking about. So uh, the reason why this is real important for this talk is because at least for certain classes of pair potentials that the Wiener constant is infinite will help distinguish between a short range and a long range uh, interaction. Okay, thinking of, of energy as, the, as our interaction or function. Okay, so um, I like this theorem a lot. Uh, it has a beautiful proof. Uh, it's very classical. Uh, Frostman, Choke, you recognize these names. Vekera, Segu, very classical. And um, uh, it states the following. And, and, and the nice part about it is K is as, as above, which is basically we're not assuming anything really. It's maybe even lower bounded if you can get away with. And, and then you can show that um, the limit as n goes to infinity of the minimum, minimum energy, so this EK, calligraphy E sub K of N, remember, is the minimum endpoint energy, uh, um, uh, grows like N squared. And in fact, if you divide by N squared, you get the limit, and that limit is precisely the Wiener constant. So our rate function here, trying to match up terminology with the previous talk, is our rate function here is N squared. And uh, furthermore, this theorem, classical theorem says that if you have any sequence of uh, uh, endpoint minimizers, 
uh, omega n star, uh, uh, then every uh, weak star limit measure called here lambda uh, as n goes to infinity of this sequence of normalized counting measures in your minimizer. So this is sometimes referred to as what empirical, empirical measures, empirical measures, is an equilibrium measure for the continuous energy problem on A. That is to say that the energy of uh, any limit measure, the K energy is equal to the Wiener constant. So um, this is probably not surprising that the discrete version of the problem uh, in a limiting sense gives you the continuous version uh, of the problem. Uh, but uh, what, uh, uh, what happens if our Wiener constant is infinite? So it is possible for the limit here to be infinite. We'll see a number of examples of that. And, and then it doesn't tell us anything about uh, the limit measures of our sequence of minimizers because, well, as we mentioned before, every uh, probability measure is a minimizer. So it gives us no information in that case. So I want to uh, now uh, uh, restrict myself to a particular class of uh, pair potentials. We introduced them at the very beginning as this first problem was the uh, Reese S potential. So our pair potential here is simply one over uh, distance between points to the power S. And we also talk about that when this S is zero in a limiting sense, uh, after taking a derivative with respect to S, you get uh, for limiting kernel, simply the log of one over the absolute value of X minus Y. This is a very important uh, a uh, kernel that, that, that arose in the previous talk and in, in the study of potential theory and so on. So, um, uh, so in this case, uh, we just abbreviate our notation here, just using subscripts S to denote energy with respect to uh, case, case of S. In the case when um, we're in R3 and, and this we have just reciprocal distance, S is equal to one, we get the Coulomb kernel and, and the study of minimum energy points is, is, is very classical. Um, uh, in, if, if, if done on the sphere, in case when A is the sphere, two-dimensional sphere sitting in R3, then this is a, the so-called Thompson problem. So the Thompson uh, problem, uh, was one in which she was um, trying to get a model, so-called plum pudding model of the atom and uh, came across this problem, which essentially was for him, putting electrons on a sphere. How, how do you do it in an optimal way, a way to minimize energy? I couldn't let a talk go by without mentioning Steve Smale. <laughs> for one thing, he's, uh, as far as I recall, uh, large Actually responsible for start in the first place, and uh, um, he's also re very much responsible for getting me started in working on this topic. Now, admittedly, logarithmic energy, the energy here K zero, uh, turns out not to be um, short range. It's a long range potential, uh, but. Um, uh, I did want to mention the exciting things and open problems, uh, and one of them that still remains. What happened was, to give you some history, Steve Smale uh, got in touch with me, called me one day. I uh, said he was coming down to Tampa, where, where I was living at that time. He said, I've got a, a problem for you in potential theory, um, and uh, can we have lunch together? So obviously I said yes. He told me about this problem, what, what, uh, which is stated uh, here, um, uh, about constructing a, a rapid algorithm. And uh, I figured, oh yeah, okay, I'll, this looks, look, looks really interesting. I'll get back to you in a, as soon as I can. Well, uh, I wasn't ever able to get back to him about, about that problem um, uh, because I never solved it. Uh, um, and what was the problem? The problem was this, for logarithmic energy, 
uh, construct uh, a rapid uh, algorithm, so polynomial time al uh, algorithm that inputs the number of points and outputs a configuration, which I call omega n hat of n points, whose uh, logarithmic energy differs from the minimum logarithmic energy uh, on the sphere, two-dimensional sphere S2, by a term that grows no worse than a constant times log n. So, uh, so this was the problem. This got me uh, working uh, on, on uh, energy uh, problems in general. And uh, in my case, um, well, what happens when you can't solve a problem, you, you often change it and, and to, some, to a point where you can say something. But, but this problem uh, remains open to this day. Uh, there are certain imp very important works. I mentioned that of Beltran and Etteo, Marzo, Ortegas, Take Serta and, uh, and a variety of people who have gotten uh, bounds or studied asymptotics for the minimum logarithmic energy on, on the sphere. Uh, Betterman and Sandier, uh, Steiner, Berger, uh, uh, Brauchart. The most recent paper I found uh, uh, is uh, on the archive is by uh, Loritzen. Um, and um, uh, Doug Harden and myself worked on. on uh, the asymptotic aspects of this uh, mi this minimum energy. Okay, so I, I leave that as a it was a side trip, uh, but uh, I feel much better now that I was able to acknowledge Steve Smale <laughs> and thank him. Uh, I hope he's listening. Okay. So uh, this Reese energy is related to the best packing problem that that I talked about earlier, namely. Um, if uh, we let uh, our functional now be simply the, the minimum pairwise distance between points of omega n, so that's our functional, um, uh, then what is the endpoint best packing problem? Uh, here we have a maximum. So remember here the, the, the optimal configurations are those that maximize the minimum pairwise distance, okay? So I'll call that delta sub n of a. Uh, so omega n star is a best packing configuration if indeed it attains that maximum uh, minimum distance. And this is our new notation for that. Um, and so uh, uh, what we're saying is that uh, as S gets large, so as the repulsion due uh, for, for this Reese energy gets larger and larger, uh, the problem really turns into one of best packing. So. So here you, you fix now uh, a number of points and we're gonna let S, the strength uh, of, the, of the interaction go to infinity. And it simply says that the minimum S energy of, uh, for N point, of these, for these N points, has a limit as S goes to infinity, which is simply one over the N point best packing distance on A. And furthermore, uh, the, the, uh, every cluster point, um, we can think of it as a weak star limit point, as S goes to infinity of, of energy minimizing endpoint configurations on A is going to be uh, an endpoint best packing configuration on A. But we're mainly uh, interested in uh, asymptotics as uh, N gets large, large N asymptotics. And uh, so what happens, uh, uh, what, what happens to the asymptotics uh, if we have minimal energy for S fixed as n goes to infinity. So S is some fixed guy, um, and uh, it could be logarithmic potential. It could be a Coulomb, etc. So um, how do these energy uh, points, mineral energy points, what do they look like for large n? So uh, so when you first face a problem like this, I have no idea. Uh, it um, you know it. What do you do? I mean, what, what do you do? You want to experiment to get some, some feeling for the topic. So the first thing that you do, most important thing you do is you find a very talented graduate student, someone who can do uh, high precision computations. And I was fortunate to have such a student, Yamu Zhao is his name. And um, uh, he, he conducted these numerical experiments uh, on the sphere S2 and the Reese parameters being zero and one. So uh, logarithmic and Coulomb case. And 
he was able to go up to n equals 200 with some conf confidence. Beyond that, uh, there were some issues, as you'll see in a minute. And, and namely, what we found is that there's bad news and good news. And the bad news I'll mention first is that there are many uh, local minima of the energy that are not uh, global. So, um, uh, and uh, uh, let's look at a picture here. Okay, yeah, I have a graph here of the situation. So the, every dot on this uh, baseline here corresponds to a situation of minimum energy, point of minimum, uh, minimum uh, energy configuration. If there's a dot above that one, that would mean that there was a critical point uh, that uh, was distinct from the minimum. <laughs> uh, of course, we take into account, obviously, the symmetry of, of the sphere and all. So, uh, so you, as you can see, as n gets large, there are more and more of these dots. Uh, and the conjecture, uh, I believe it's due to Hockney and Erber, uh, is that the number of such relative uh, mins goes um, uh, grows exponentially within. Um, but there is some good news here, actually, and, and that's that is the vertical axis. The vertical axis is, is the, is, is the uh, measuring the difference between the local uh, energy, local min, and the global min. And as you can see, uh, these guys are uh, scaled like in the hundredths. But we have seen before uh, with the classical theorem that the energy uh, in these cases were zero and one uh, are going to uh, grow like n squared. So if you're out here at, at 100, the energy ought to be on the order of 10,000, and yet the different the, the the difference in their total energies is on the order of 100. So so that makes it rather uh, difficult. The, the combination of being many having many local minima and um, uh, uh, and having these minima very close in value to one another makes it a very challenging computational problem. So my, uh, uh, my graduate student was all rather artistically talented as well. And so he, he kind of uh, um, uh, drew this, got, you know, created this image, which has uh, the sphere. And what we're talking about here is 122 electrons. So this is reciprocal distance or Coulomb. Um, uh, on uh, on S two, and uh, what you observed is that these uh, uh, what we plotted here. These are the hundred and twenty two points. These the yellow dots, and what we have made from them are is a Voronoi a di Voronoi uh, uh, regions that they um, create. So uh, by Voronoi region, of course, we mean nearest neighbor region. So a point is in here, uh, uh, if and only if it's closer to this dot than any of the other dots, okay? So that's your Voronoi. And that gives us a tessellation, and this somehow looks like the, the classical uh, football design, uh, or in the US we'd say soccer ball design, okay? All right, so I mentioned that there's also uh, good news, and that's it from you can this, seeing this, that the these points uh, try to distribute themselves over a really uh, nearly uh, spherical hexagonal net. In fact, they look pretty regular hexagons. And the reason for this, um, well, let's go on to a larger number, say uh, 1600. So uh, here's, here's uh, the picture for 1600. These dots are a lot smaller. I hope you can see them, but this is the Voronoi diagram for that. Uh, 1,600 points, and, and what you see is that there's a big green ocean of, of hexagons. Okay. So most of the, uh, most of the, the, by far, the large majority of the Voronoi cells are, are hexagons. And um, okay, roughly the reason for this is that locally uh, the earth is flat, the sphere is flat locally, and in, two, in 2D, in the two-dimensional plane, uh, best packing and best covering problems are, are solved by by the hexagon, uh, as um, as known in nature uh, by uh, say bees that uh, where they store store their honey is a, sort of an optimal arrangement. These blue and green uh, uh, Voronoi cells these are five sided and seven sided. 
uh, cells, and uh, they are uh, they create what is called scars or dislocations on the sphere. The study of them is, is very interesting, and, and we're very far from understanding it completely. Uh, so that was S equals one. If we go to S equals four, so this is this is the integrable case, S equals one. We go to a non-integrable case, a case where the Wiener constant, in fact, is infinite, is when S is four. And, and um, uh, you can see that, okay, well, other than the difference in slight difference in shade, there's, there are these buttons that occur as well. Uh, they look pretty much the same. You still have the same ocean uh, of mostly uh, hexagons. Um, so, uh, so one last remark before we go on is that in this case for S equals one, it, it's quite easy to show that asymptotically the large N limit of, of, of minimizing configurations is gonna be distributed uniformly. And that, that just follows from classical potential theory because there's going to be a, a unique minimizer in that case. It has uh, to um, have, a, be, have this rotational symmetry. So it's gonna to have to be the uniform measure. Now, when we get uh, over here to S equals four, uh, well, everybody's going to say, just for looking at this, yeah, those points, they look pretty, pretty uniformly distributed, except with those exceptions, which are, are not great in number. Uh, they're very uniformly uh, distributed, but go ahead and prove it. We don't have the tools of potential theory to do so. So uh, that was a challenge for some time to actually come up with some uh, a nice proof that, that uh, in the limit as n goes to infinity when s is equal to four, on the sphere S2 that, that the limiting distribution was uniform. Um, actually, I got together with the Harden uh, once I arrived at Vanderbilt and we were able to resolve that issue and show that indeed uh, such configurations, such optimal configurations are uniformly distributed. Okay, so uh, uh, these, uh, uh, the, the previous ones were on the sphere and, and, and it's kinds of, it kind of hides uh, the differences between uh, minimizers for, for uh, Reese potentials of different strength, that the pictures all basically look the same. So uh, let's jump to what we'll call here uh, the torus, a bagel. I apologize for that. Um, and uh, there are these dots on that bagel, uh, which we'll <laughs> uh, talk about. Uh, and so the torus here is. Um, is uh, two-dimensional. It's a two-dimensional object, and and uh, it's just the the surface of this uh, this torus, the two-dimensional surface of this bagel, so to speak. And um, and what we're showing here is a thousand points in each case, and uh, but they look quite different depending on the parameters. So I don't know if you can read this, but this this one here has has an s value that's pretty small which is 0.5, we move over here, this 0.8, and so on down the line. So notice when, when S is very small, there in fact are no uh, minimizing configurations on the portion of the torus with negative curvature. They're all on the, with positive curvature. Um, now you can say, well, okay, we'll just increase in, and they'll start coming in here. And uh, that was a conjecture that was around for a while, and. Uh, and we're able to prove that, that that's not the case. In fact, this looks pretty much like uh, the limit, uh, the uh, large N limit, uh, it becomes just a, con a, a connected set, a continuum on the torus, uh, and it lies on the, on the uh, positive portion of it only. So what you're seeing, these dots are, are, are pretty indicative of what the limiting behavior is. Point eight, what happens there is these points start coming in, um, uh, still, there's an area that's free of these points. Uh, there are, uh, uh, here we have S equals one, the Coulomb case. Yeah, there are points all over this uh, torus, but thinner on the inner portion. Here, uh, when S is two, uh, this, this guy looks uh, very uniform in terms of the distribution of points. So, uh, um, this same is true when S is three and four. So, so um, uh, yeah, so, so we call this sort of the perfect poppy seed bagel. Uh, and so where did that come about? How did that come about? Well, 
this, what you're seeing here is essentially what appeared on the cover of the notices of the American Mouse Society back in 2004. And I got um, a phone call from uh, Scott Simon, who is the host of uh, the, a national uh, radio station, um, National Public Radio. And he asked, uh, he, you know, he had seen this uh, cover of the notices, wanted to talk to me about it. Um, and um, uh, so uh, I was going to face, I faced an interview and with great trepidation talking about a talking about a theorem to a national public uh, public audience or people from all all, all over. And uh, so I, I, uh, I turned to my wife and said, well, how am I going to explain all of this? And she said, well, it just looks like poppy seed bagels. So just talk to them about poppy seed bagels. And, and the perfect poppy seed bagel, you would take a bite no matter where you took that bite. Uh, as long as it's a bite of the same size, you should get roughly the same number of poppy seeds. So, so that's how we came about that. Um, and now I want to, to present the main theorem dealing with, with that torus that explains the behavior. So, so essentially what's happening here is that in these first three, these are situations where we have long range interaction and the, the remaining three, we're in the short range case. So here's the situation. Uh, um, uh, here when S is less than the dimension of our set, D is two in the previous example. If S is less than two, uh, or more generally less than the dimension of our set A, then uh, our minimum energy uh, grows like N squared. Uh, it's, the ratio has a limit, which is the Wiener constant, and the Wiener constant is finite in this case. So classical, classical potential theory applies there. Once you get uh, to a, an infinite Wiener constant, you get a set of capacity there's no material theorem to work with. So you have to invent new tools. So, so what does the poppy seed bagel theorem say? So the one that was presented in that notices article, it says the following, if you take uh, uh, S, S, our least parameter bigger than or equal to the dimension of our set, you assume your, your set uh, is derectifiable, which means that it's the Lipschitz image of a compact set in RD. Um, and um, well, we need a little bit more assumptions when S actually equals D. So right on the border between short range and long range. Uh, there we assume we have a C1 manifold. And then this, this ratio, this ratio uh, of the minimum energy in the case when S is equal to D, when that breeze parameter precisely matches the dimension is that it grows like N squared log N. And the, ratio, and the limit of this ratio is the volume, the D-dimensional volume of the unit ball divided by the D-dimensional, this is Hausdorff dimension, uh, Hausdorff measure, uh, the Hausdorff, the, the Hausdorff measure uh, of, of, of A. Uh, when S is bigger than D, then the energy grows even faster. And our rate function here uh, goes from N squared log N to N to the one plus S over D. Remember it was N squared back when S was less than D. And here we show that it, this ratio has a limit and it's represented by this fraction. The denominator is, is something you would easily expect. Uh, H, uh, the, the D-dimensional measure of A to the power S over D. The numerator is some constant, which I put here as uh, CSD. And uh, this constant here does not, uh, CSD is a constant that does not depend on A. And it's a fascinating one. And um, I hope I have enough time to, um, to talk more about it. Um, so, so we found, we were able to prove that the, this ratio uh, has a limit. Uh, we can't tell you in general what the CSD is. Uh, it is known uh, for only D equals um, one, uh, D uh, equals, uh, <laughs> D equals eight and D equals 24. So rather, rather strange. I'll, I'll try to explain that in a minute, but, uh, but here, here's this, the point about the, the limiting distribution. It says that if you, if the D, to, D me, uh, Hausdorff measure, if the measure of your set is A is positive, strictly positive, then optimal uh, S energy configurations are asymptotically uniformly distributed on A with respect to HD. 
So uh, I don't have time to go through this slide, but it basically says, hey, not only do they have a uniform distribution with respect to surface area, uh, if, if, uh, if you're on the, on the torus, but um, uh, they have nice local behavior. They, they, they're well separated. They obtain optimal order separation and optimal order covering. Okay. All right. So a, a word about a word about um, uh, a word about the the proof. So uh, the idea is to make good use of the, the separation, uh, the, the, the the short range property. Um, so what you do is you start off with uh, the unit cube, d-dimensional cube. You make a good choice of points in there. You scale that cube down by a factor of, of uh, one over m. Well, actually slightly less than one over m. And you repeat that scaled down version uh, uh, m, to, m, m to the d times and form a new collection of points. Those you'll have precisely capital N times M to the D points. And you can relate uh, the energy of such a configuration as shown here to the original configuration you started with uh, as the sum of two quantities. The first is a scalable quantity, okay? So because of the nature of the interaction, it's, it's scalable and, and we, can, we can say something about it. We can pull this gamma over M out. And then there are cube Q interactions and because we're dealing with this, this long range property. We can show that a uh, short range back property, sorry, that we can show that this cube, cube, these cube, cube uh, interactions go to zero uh, in the limit as n goes to infinity when divided by n to the one plus s over d. So, so the in limiting case, these cube, cube interactions are negligible. So um, I, uh, I don't think I have much time for this. I don't know whether this is going to work, or as you can see it, but, but here's uh, an animation provided. Um, uh, your S parameter is here. Uh, when S is two is the point exactly where, we, where uh, the poppy seed bagel theorem takes over and, and says, hey, all these guys are, are going to be uh, uh, in the uniform, in a limiting sense, they're going to be uniformly distributed. So, uh, okay. All right, so I, uh, I don't have time to talk about this constant CSD. That would be a great question if somebody uh, has, can ask it at the end of my talk. I know we started a little late, but I need to get to uh, the what's new. <laughs> and what's new is, is this large N asymptotics for general class of short range uh, functionals E. And so what we're going to do uh, is make, uh, 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 is our game plan. So for um, some class of simple sets like cubes, uh, like cubes, establish that the limit of our uh, energy functional uh, divided by uh, a rate function T, uh, that, that limit exists. And in so doing, uh, one can often show that you can deduce the limiting distribution of your optimal configuration. So I call it L sub E of, of A. So that uh, is a condition two. Condition two, you have to remember is that. After you get that done, what you do in the second step is to extend from this collection of, of simple self-similar sets, such as cubes, you extend that to more general sets, uh, say your done measurable sets. Uh, this is done in the case of, 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 uh, of Jordan measurable sets for quantization and, and compact sets in the hypersingular case uh, for Ries. And the third is to go ahead and, and work with uh, embedded embedded sets. So, so we, we need to go from there to uh, embedded sets to get our theorem. One of the things that we can show is that these rate functions are necessarily going to be uh, regularly varying. They're going to have this, this property uh, where this constant sigma is called a scaling factor and lies in this interval. So, um, so what we're saying is that our rate function will necessarily have to grow something like n to the one plus sigma if we uh, uh, know this is true, say on cubes, 
and we have that separation property, which was property number one, the separation kind of condition with that, uh, that I refer to as the uh, short range condition. All right, so, uh, so then our main theorem is, and I hope uh, I can, can I, can I buy uh, five more minutes? Is that possible? Five, no, no, you're asking for a lot here. Uh, oh, okay, so, well, okay, if I can just have uh, two more minutes, that'd be great. So, um, uh, so, so the general theorem now, this sort of generalized Poppy C. Bagel theorem says that if you've got some, some scalable and continuity, simple scalable and continuity conditions that we have to talk about, uh, uh, then it follows that for any derectifiable set, this limit uh, uh, will exist. So this L sub E of A, that will exist and be given by uh, a constant C E D, uh, so magic constant, times the d-dimensional Hausdorff measure of A uh, raised to this scaling constant uh, minus the scaling constant sigma. And moreover, the normalized counting measures will converge weak star to the normalized Hausdorff measure restricted to A. So this is the situation for unweighted cases. And uh, for quantization, um, this follows the spirit of Gruber's result um, um, and um, uh, where he, his, his, his magic number, what I call CSD is uh, he calls DIV, but that's for quantization, quite different. And so uh, I will uh, be able to, I just wanna present this last theorem, this, this uh, uh, we'll make this the last theorem, which what happens to weighted trunk, K truncated kernels. So what is the theorem here? So this is a new theorem. Uh, and uh, it says, remember uh, our formulation, but now we have a weight involved. So this W is positive continuous weight. We have S. And in fact, here S is any guy greater than zero. And it says, look, uh, if I look at the minimizers, uh, they grow like N to the one plus S over D and their limit is given by this integral. And moreover, they're, the counting measures in these minimizers are uniformly distributed uh, with respect to this weight function. So, so the weight function along the diagonal. So this is a density actually with respect to d-dimensional Hausdorff measure. So the notable consequences uh, are that for any positive continuous density row, we can imitate that density and produce points that behave just like that by choosing our weight in this manner. Uh, that, um, and, and, and this is rather surprising that to recover a given distribution, it suffices to minimize um, uh, any of the functionals, uh, energy functionals with a risk kernel parameter S greater than zero, uh, uh, only for taking into inner into account interactions between nearest, the nearest, the nearest neighbor. So, so we thereby reduce the co cost of, of computations to n squared instead of n. And uh, lastly, um, that uh, we can do this even for say the log potential or for any, any, any uh, uh, potential, uh, Reese potential for any value of S bigger than or equal to, to zero. You only have to take into account the nearest guy in order to generate uh, your desired uh, density distribution. So, so with that, I'll, I'll end uh, just trying to show you this picture, uh, which is the actual computation using uh, uh, 18 nearest points uh, and 4,000, uh, N is 4,000. And it's a great using a gradient descent, and this is what it looks like. So there are still these these dislocations. The majority of configurations that are Voronoi cells are again hexagons, uh, but there are these scars or dislocations that occur as 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 well. Okay, so uh, I'm sorry to go overboard, and and I thank you very much for for your attention. Thank you, Ed. I mean, this was a very lively and even appetizing talk <laughs> with the poppy seed bagels.
So I'd like to invite people uh, who want to ask a question uh, to raise their hands. Um, but in order for people to feel welcome to do so, maybe I'll start with a um, kind of a small question. So you showed us, you know, these numerical experiments of your students. But mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, and I was wondering, so you, to compute the minimum, do you have to compute, um, compute all the local minima and then you compare the value? <laughs> is there the way of going directly to the global? I mean, can you think of a method to go directly to the global minimum? Or could you comment more on the numerical issues that you kind of hinted at? Yeah, um, uh, I, I, cannot, I cannot think of, um, of such um, a technique. Uh, what, what happens is, is we do a gradient descent. This is what has been done. And uh, in that gradient uh, descent, uh, we initiate it by choosing points randomly on the sphere. And we do it for a variety of, of different random configurations starting. So you might run it, you know, a thousand with a thousand different initial initializing points. Uh, what we can do when things get very large is we can sort of use start off with good points. So there are a number of algorithms that give us good points on the sphere. Um, so uh, um, I've been in, involved. Uh, with spiral points or one equal area points. There are um, recent diamond points of Beltran and, and Ateo. Uh, so, so, uh, so a good starting configuration, I think, uh, really helps uh, improve the computational aspect. Thank you. And so you mentioned the, uh, the, uh, the need for high precision. So why is it so? Uh, because the energy, um, the energy for your local min is very close to uh, uh, the energy for your global min. So th that's what we've experienced in all cases. Uh, and, and that that's sometimes difficult to do. So there are there are tables out there, and and uh, there are uh, improvements <laughs> being found every day, uh, even in the Coulomb case. Um, it might be a reported uh, value for the minimum, but it, in fact, uh, uh, someone was a little bit more clever and, and able to lower the energy slightly. So, so uh, any such table will pretty much have to be a work in progress as, as more and more people <laughs> experiment with it, uh, they may uncover something uh, with even smaller energy. Okay, that's very interesting. So again, uh, I hope it's not a problem, but I'm not seeing any raised hands. So um, nobody to ask the obvious question that you asked for. So uh, maybe we'll leave it at that. And thank you again for these um, nice pictures. Uh, maybe in the chat, you could give us the link to the, YouTube, to the video that you presented us because uh, unfortunately we didn't see it. So maybe you could, um, Put, if there is a link on some YouTube or some place where it's available, maybe you oh, can okay. take time to, um, to put it in the chat. But I think with that, I'm going to um, thank everybody for joining tonight for this uh, third session of the FOCM seminar. And maybe um, um, our host will kind of allow to everybody to unmute and to uh, Start their, um, I think I can, uh, yes, I think everybody's on mute and they can start their video at this stage. So if anybody wants to make an announcement or um, 